Hey, welcome back to the channel. In this week's video, I'd kind of like us to get the bed put on our truck. One thing we'll have to get taken care of first is running our brake line. So we'll tie the passenger side and the driver's side together and then run a hard line up front. And we'll probably just leave plenty of slack out here so then we can bend it up to the master cylinder once we, that, once we get that and know where to bend it. But we definitely don't want to be trying to work in here with a bed on it. One thing I did notice that's going to be a problem is it appears that this bushing, which is on a concentric, so it essentially is your adjustment uh, for this independent rear suspension of where the top of the wheel goes in and out, looks like it may need replaced because, yeah, slack. So first things first, I'm going to take that suspension apart and see what that bushing is going to look like. I know it'll have to be special ordered. Nobody stocks anything. I've already checked. So let's get on it. All right, so these little bushings are basically the spacer that keeps this dead centered in the rear suspension. Of course, they just come off no problem, but the issue clearly is this concentric section, which is really lightweight aluminum, it just has nothing but space here. I mean, that is like, there's nothing inside there but dirt. I'm assuming at one point there was some rubber material, but clearly that would be no good. Here's the passenger side that I pulled out. Oh, these are just the little end bushings. But yeah, the uh, rubber that goes in these is basically just turned into powder over time. The new ones have shown up and they are a different design. It looks like uh, this intersection is all one piece instead of having essentially uh, a rubber section here and then another section of rubber in between this outside sleeve and this inner aluminum shaft. Oh, we've got them both out. Now we're going to press the new ones in. So let's get to the brake lines. Now I've got my tools laid out here as well as some of the parts that I've ordered in. This is 25 foot of PVF coated steel brake line and it's in 3 16th. PVF stands for polyvinyl fluoride, I think. It's basically a corrosion protection, highly recommended for people up north um, that deal with a lot of salty roads, things like that. I like it because it looks pretty cool. Um, but it is going to make it a little tougher to bend and flare. Here's one version of a tool that'll do just 3 16 You buy it based on the size brake line that you're going to use. It will do double flaring, and there's a way to make it just a bubble flare if you do it just right. So I'll show those on screen now, the difference between the two. The majority of cars now all use bubble flare. You don't see too much double flare on anything made um, in the last 10 years or so, but there may be exceptions that I just don't know about. Now, the way to quickly tell the difference, this is our T that we're going to use when we tie together both of the rear brake lines into one, so we'll only use one brake line uh, towards the front of the car. We'll need another one as well for the two front brake lines that'll tie together and then feed to the master cylinder once we get it. But if you look, material raises up towards the center hole when you need to use a double flare uh, for proper sealing. But then if you look in this end, you'll notice it aims down towards the center hole, which means you would use a bubble flare for that type of connection. Here's some examples of uh, the different types of fitting 
This is a SAE threaded uh, fitting for a double flare and you can see that the threading goes all the way up to the top of this tube nut and then it's tapered in for that double flare to rest. This is the same thing except in metric uh, thread pitch. You can just see that the threads go all the way to the top. These last two are the same thread pitch as those, SAE and the metric. But if you notice, the threads don't go all the way to the top. There's a long shoulder on the top edge of both of these tube nuts, and then they're inverted. These are examples of bubble flare tube nuts. Now here's our pretty inexpensive tubing bender that does uh, three different sizes. It's probably not ideal for doing a lot of production work. You should buy a tool that's for the size that you need or one that you insert different dies in there. Probably be a little bit stronger, but we're not trying to make a living running brake lines. Here's our cutter. It's eighth to five eighths OD ideal uh, for cutting brake line or, or hard lines anyway. And here's a little, I don't know, a little more common setup for doing double flares. And you can also use it to do bubble flares, although it's probably not the best at it. And essentially the way this one works is similar to the hand, the smaller handheld. You loosen these up, you run your brake line in there, you snug it down. Use one of these guys to tell you how far out you should have the brake line sticking. Uh, from where it's inserted Then you can kind of see it has a little bit of a taper uh, in that center pin you drop that inside the brake line And then you run this clamp down on it and to where it'll create the bubble flare then you can remove this and Run this straight down on it without any kind of insert and that'll concave the top and create a double flare the last thing on our table that we haven't talked about is this residual pressure valve. Now this one's red, and it also has 10 PSI printed on it. Red is typically synonymous with a 10 PSI RPV or residual pressure valve. Now the reason this exists is because you need to maintain a small amount of pressure in your brake line on certain applications. In our application, we're using drum brakes on the rear. Now, drum brakes have springs that help collapse um, the pads back closer to each other or the shoes to where they're not constantly rubbing against the drum itself. Now, that spring uh, or actuation of the spring creates a distance between the shoe and the drum on purpose. Well, what the residual pressure valve does in the 10 PSI variant is keep just enough pressure against those springs so when you mash your brake pedal, you don't have to fill up that amount of space in order for the brakes to become in contact with the drum. The other version that exists is uh, two PSI, which are typically blue, and those are for certain street rods that say the master cylinder is actually below the level of the caliper, so it technically would be pumping brake fluid uphill. So just two PSI of line pressure will prevent that backflow of uh, the brake fluid into the master cylinder and you don't have to force that back again and therefore eliminating extra throw in the brake pedal when you're ready to stop. And we'll start with enough length to run that passenger side rear brake line across to the driver's side and tie it in at the T. We're gonna go ahead and build a bubble flare on here because that's the type of fitting that's over there on that rubber section that goes out to the wheel. This is our stop. Tells us how far the brake line should be fed inside the tool. Now we can tighten these up. back out the stop and we want to install this OP1 in there first after we put just a little bit of this lubricant on there.
Now that's bottomed out. Now you can see what we've created. Now, if we put this die in with this side down, it would indent the top, and that would be your double flare fitting, which would go in to an item like this. Now the other end of this brake line is going to go into this union, which, as we showed you earlier, is going to require a double flare. Also, since this is going to be the other end of this brake line, we're going to need to remember to put the tube nut on this brake line before we create that flare. So the bubble flare should be in there now, but remember, this time we need a double flare. So we're going to turn this tool over, put a little lubricant on this end of the die and we're going to run this in and compress it to give it that concave. Now you'll notice on this flare it indents in the top which will allow it to seat nicely in this type of fitting. Now we'll just run a brake line from the driver's side. Really got to pay close attention and keep these brake lines nice and tight because there's going to be a shock mount get welded here sometime in the near future. This last bin is going to be super tight, so we're going to have to go ahead and get this fitting on here and the flare done before we create this last 90. Notice doing that double flare really flakes off that PVF coating. So you want to make sure and clean that out of your way and of course run compressed air through any of your brake lines before you do the final install just like we did when we ran our fuel lines. Alright, well, that's an interesting looking line, but that's how we had to do them ourselves. Yep, that's gonna be just fine. And I realize there's no reason in running this brake line from the front and plugging it into here when that'll be fairly easy to do from under the truck, just uh, inserting that one in and snugging it up and then slight bends all the way to get to the front. But that's brake lines, that's flaring for double flare, for bubble flare, identifying the types of fittings and identifying the application uh, on the female side of which flare to do and a couple of the tools that you should use to do it. So I'm pretty stoked. That's a maybe a small step for man, but a giant leap for truck build. Also getting those rear suspension bushings, first of all, noticed that they were just wasted and getting those replaced much handier to do it now than whenever the truck's got the bed bolted on it and 
be kind of a big deal. Next week, we'll probably start cutting on the bed to make it fit on this customized chassis now and uh, see how things look and we can maybe get our shock mounts welded on finally. I appreciate you guys watching. We'll see you next time.